Thank you, Bob. I would like to say that it is because of Bob Wilson's mentorship that I was able to complete that first book on Jeremiah and careened into the study of the prophetic literature under Bob's guidance. So thank you for that. I am very glad to speak to you this morning about prophetic witness and public leadership. I believe we are living in urgent times that call out for prophetic witness. Our children are growing up in an era fraught with challenge at every level of our common life. Militarized conflicts are destroying human lives and causing devastating, perhaps even irreparable damage to cultural infrastructures and material resources in numerous countries, especially in the Middle East and Africa. The unprecedented brutality of drug cartels holding sway in northern Mexico and other regions in Central and South America has created a truly dire situation that has left countless families grieving needless and terrible loss. The scandalously high rate of incarceration in the United States is the object of dismay throughout the developed world. The constitutive inequity of the correctional system in this country has been well documented, particularly in the drastically disproportionate punitive measures leveled against black men and other offenders of color. Women and girls in some countries controlled by fundamentalist religious groups cannot pursue education without harm to the well-being of their families and even risk to their very lives. Here in the United States, the cost of education continues to rise, something perhaps everyone in this room has experienced in one way or another. Some may even still be paying off student loans, I don't know. Uh, and funding for federal education grants for poor families may be threatened depending on the outcome of this election season. Crime, domestic abuse, and addiction continue virulently to deform the lives of so many in inner city New Haven and countless other places. You could supply your own points in this list of emergencies, I know. There are so many things to lament in our common life, so much to deplore, so much that we must work to change. And so I am glad that you are here this morning because I know that among the graduates and friends of Yale Divinity School are remarkably gifted, dedicated, brave folks. Talented people, you and others, with hope and energy who are doing and will do everything you can to respond to the needs of the world. Whether you are a priest or pastor, social justice advocate or teacher, lawyer, business leader, healthcare professional, public servant, or homemaker raising children to speak the truth. You know that these times cry out for effective leadership. And I'm guessing you know that visionary prophetic witness is urgently needed in the churches and synagogues and mosques, in the business world, in the nonprofit sector, in the public square. This morning I want to think with you about ways in which the ancient Hebrew prophets can serve as resources for contemporary prophetic witness in public leadership. First, I will say just a few words about my view of leadership. Uh, this is not something they pay me for at Yale, so this is just me talking about things in which I have no PhD. And I know that you will have also your own experience, both serving as leaders and perhaps training leaders, writing or preaching about leadership. I do hope to save some time at the end for common discussion. So first then, some words on leadership. Second, I will guide us into some reflections on the diversity of roles that prophets played in ancient Israel. And then, if time permits, two very brief glimpses at new biblical studies methods, all as a means of making more visible to you, I hope, the rich possibilities for prophetic leadership in your own life and in the life of your community. I am eager to have conversation among all of us about the challenges and opportunities you see for prophetic leadership in the arenas that matter most to you, whether those be worshiping community or place of work, your local community, or on the national or international stage. First then, some brief reflections about leadership in a Christian framework. 
Within the Christian perspective, we affirm that we love our endlessly creative God and serve our cherished neighbor in a world that is deeply fractured by sin and violence. We follow one who taught peacemaking and truth-telling, one who healed the pain and shame of those who came to him, one who challenged radically those misuses of power, social, political, clerical, that distorted the integrity of life in community. Thus, we know that we are called to peacemaking and truth-telling, to healing and to radical challenge. And if your own tradition is not Christianity, I invite you warmly to reflect also on ways in which your own tradition invites you to peacemaking, truth-telling, healing, and challenge. For Christians, because we follow Christ, we know that redemption is possible even in the very darkest shadows. We also know that callous exploitation, the aggressive assertion of power, and the fetishizing of hierarchical status cannot have any part in Christian leadership because our Savior showed us another way, the way of humility, according to the ancient hymn in Philippians 2. I would suggest three characteristics of Christian leadership that matter to me. You will have your own thoughts, of course, on this as well, and I hope you will share them. Uh, these are spiritually focused comments, not my opinions about the skill sets or temperament types most needed in leadership. I do have lots of thoughts on those things as well. I love thinking about how leaders can empower the giftedness of others and call it force. I like thinking about operational elegance and efficiency. Uh, I like thinking about the skills needed for collaboration and community building. So I like those tactical discussions, but that is not my brief today. So some spiritual reflections then on Christian leadership. First, Christian leadership should be prayerful. As believers hoping for and working toward the reign of God, we are not chiefly about managing our own goals and objectives however fond we may be of them, and I'm very fond of my to-do list, I have to tell you. Um, even if those goals and objectives are, and we hope uh, most of the time, are consonant with the gospel, we are about seeking to have the mind of Christ, seeking to further the purposes of God, seeking to make known the good news of God's love in Christ. And so we must be about prayer. Here I speak not so much of intercessory or petitionary prayer as centering prayer, that deep letting go of self and desires that allows us to perceive the renewed divine invitation, inviting us into the heart of what is most true, into the heart of God. Scripture encourages us to pray without ceasing and to persevere in prayer. Regular prayer, especially when combined with a desire to cultivate a habit, approaching unceasing prayer, constant prayer, even if perhaps you can get there, still working on it myself, but approaching praying without ceasing, can move the leader beyond a fixation on particular outcomes. And I think this is crucial for Christian witness, even as we cherish our hopes for particular outcomes. Prayer opens our spirits to the marvelous unfolding creativity of God, which cannot be plotted on company charts, identified in educational objectives, assessed in the ratio of cases won to cases lost, or measured in referrals and client contact hours. Prayer is absolutely essential for discernment, which in the instance of Christian leadership is the clear perception of the guiding of the Holy Spirit. Second, Christian leadership should be joyful. In word, deed, and demeanor, we must seek always to account for the hope that is in us, showing our trust in God's mercy and God's goodness through all of the challenges we face and the very real pain and loss to which we are required to stay present. A joyful leader communicates that with God, all things are possible, even, of course, the cheerful bearing of failure. 
A leader with a joyful heart cannot help but invite others into service because the pull is strong, indeed positively evangelistic, when others encounter the trust and peace and delight that are the hallmarks of joy. Scripture exhorts us to rejoice in the Lord always, and the Christian leader must seek prayerfully to inhabit that place of joy, even when dealing realistically and pragmatically with the confusion, anger, anxiety, and grief of the world. We can be joyful even when we don't understand. We can be joyful as we wrestle, joyful through our tears. This joy is a gift of the Holy Spirit, and it is one of the most powerful charisms of the Christian leader. Third, Christian leadership should be carried out in love. It goes without saying that the Christian believer and the Christian community alike should seek to ground their identity fully and completely in the extravagant love of God that we know in Christ Jesus. It also goes without saying that we fail at this daily, even hourly. Nevertheless, love must lie at the heart of every Christian initiative, must motivate every project under the guidance of a Christian leader, however imperfectly that love might be realized on the ground. Scripture urges that all we do be done in love. The Christian leader understands that love is not just a welcome byproduct of effective tactics, but in fact the entire purpose of ministry, to inhabit and proclaim the love of God in Christ Jesus. Those are my initial musings on Christian leadership, not practical at all, but I could talk for hours with you and listen to your ideas about strategies and you know, operations and systems, and I do like that. Nevertheless, without these characteristics, we're not talking about Christian leadership, we're simply talking about effective management. Not a bad thing, but not Christian leadership necessarily. So I will be eager to hear what you find essential then in regards to Christian leadership when we have some time for discussion. I would just share in closing that as an Episcopal priest, when I give the blessing at the end of a service of Holy Eucharist, I offer the congregation those three scriptural exhortations that we've just considered. Pray without ceasing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let all that you do be done in love. It is my perhaps naive view that when we seek earnestly with God's help to realize those three spiritual habits in our lives and in our practices, world-changing transformation can occur. Now, how can the biblical prophets help us with leadership in this complex and beautiful and wounded world? Let's consider fleetingly, we could spend a year, we do, don't we, Bob, spend a year on this or longer, but for a few minutes perhaps, uh, let's consider the richness of the prophetic corpus in scripture. Biblical prophets as a resource, for Christian leadership. Who are the prophets and what do they do? You all know the answer to that, right? Because you've probably been through Old Testament interpretation here at one point or another and perhaps have read the prophets, perhaps continue to delve deeply into the prophetic corpus. But let me just guide you toward a few points. The ancient prophets are mediators between the purposes of God and the needs of the world. As members themselves of the beloved covenant community of Israel, the prophets live in the intersection of God's will and covenanted human life, perceiving and communicating God's purposes through the work of their spiritual imaginations, through their bodies used often enough as signs or performance art in their prophetic witness, and through then their relationships with their communities. Living in the intersection there, prophets are boundary figures. They live out their witness and their ministry in a terrible intimacy with God, uniquely aware of the vulnerability of being human. The prophets are mediators of disruption. They are disruptive folks. Prophets respond to crisis and evoke crisis, as Walter Brueggemann has said. The prophets see what is at stake 
in the sins and moral failures all around them. Prophets respond then to crisis, military, certainly, also theological and social. But the prophets also catalyze crisis by their words of impending doom and their urgent exhortations to see, to understand. Brueggemann says that the prophets speak in images and metaphors that aim to disrupt and destabilize. If you have um, ever taken a good look at Hosea or Ezekiel or Amos or, okay, Jeremiah or <laughs> a lot of them, um, and you feel profoundly unsettled, disturbed, um, wishing to look away but unable to do so, angered, alarmed. It is because the prophets are so brilliant at disrupting our smugness, our complacency, our inattentiveness and indifference to what matters in the lives of communities. So they're disruptive. The prophets and the prophetic books writ larger invite us into that liminality, into life on the threshold. They invite us into the turbulence of mediated disruption and they tell us that our lives and souls are at stake. To heed the prophets is to understand that we are to be present to God and the world at the exact same time and to serve in that excruciating place, loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and our neighbor as ourselves. And so the first point I would draw from the biblical prophets is this, the Christian leader must be willing to stand on that threshold in that agonizing place where the stakes are terrifyingly clear. The Christian leader must dare to remain in relationship with both the holy and the profane, neither solving the problems of the world, right? You all know from your pastoral care training, or many of you perhaps, that it's about the worst thing you can do to offer premature closure for someone who is struggling with anguish. Uh, so staying present to anguish and pain not writing it off, not solving or closing it, also staying fully present to the holy, not yielding to cynicism that says God is a distant watchmaker who is letting the world spin out, or God does not see what goes on. The leader in a Christian framework must be willing not to look away. The leader must choose to continue to see both the power and beauty of the sacred and the heart-wrenching fragility and pain of the human condition. Second then, prophets intercede and warn, you know this, and you have probably been hammered by the warnings of doom in the prophets if you've read through any of the prophetic books from start to finish. Moses intercedes time and time again on behalf of the people of Israel when they anger God, and God comes you know, this close to obliterating them. Intercession is an essential prophetic function. The prophet pleads for mercy on behalf of the people and only because of that pleading do the people survive. Indeed, it is chilling when Amos falls silent. There's a moment in the book of Amos where he does not intercede. And when Jeremiah is expressly forbidden to intercede and when Ezekiel is bound in, with actual cords, rendered mute and commanded not to weep. All signs of his inability to intercede, whether through prayer or through warning the people. We need prophets to plead for us. Warning, also essential. The prophets serve as sentinels upon the ramparts of the cultural and social confidence, overconfidence of their communities. A central purpose of the prophetic literature is to warn the people of the dire consequences of their cultic political and moral transgressions. And so I glean this, Christian leaders must be bold to implore God's mercy and courageous in naming injustice, daring to speak the truth to our communities about sin and exploitation. Famously, uh, what is most central I think in the popular imagination, prophets foretell, they foretell the future in the book of Kings, on which Bob Wilson is, at, as we speak, writing the definitive commentary. He's probably writing it in his mind right now. Um, so look for that in a couple years. Um, 
in the Book of Kings, prophets predict what will happen to this or that kingly dynasty, and then it comes true. Um, in the latter prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and so forth, foretelling usually has to do what, with what will happen to Israel and Judah or to other nations. In Kings, the prophetic word is always fulfilled, and not partially or with difficulty, but fully and completely. It is always an efficacious word, full of the power of God and irresistible. Conversely, we get the sense in some of the latter prophets, especially Jeremiah and Ezekiel, that the prophets have pleaded with the people for generation after generation to no avail. The prophetic word is not something that is automatically fulfilled, but rather is conceived of as an invitation to heed God's truth, an invitation that the people can reject. The foretelling of the prophets is always based on a deep understanding of the history of the people of God. Even as we see in Ezekiel 20, a radically revisionist history perhaps, that tells the people things about themselves and their shared life that they might not want to hear. For example, in the case of Ezekiel, that the people chosen by God, called out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, um, have been stubbornly sinful since before they even left Egypt, a scandalous retelling of Israel's covenant history. The prophetic word may be doom, is in fact very often, perhaps even characteristically, according to Jeremiah 28, a word of judgment. But it may on occasion be a word of salvation, thanks be to God. Uh, prophets offer oracles of promise, luminous visions of God's transformation of the created order and God's coming vindication and healing of the faithful. Think of Isaiah's vision of the peaceable kingdom, Jeremiah's promise of the new covenant written on the heart from which the Christian tradition has adopted Eucharistic liturgical language. Thus, the Christian leader who is attentive to the prophets must know the past, and must be keen-eyed in discerning the truth of the present moment in order to know implications for the future. The Christian leader grounded in the past and keen-eyed about the present must dare to share that vision with a community that may well be indifferent or hostile. Much more could be said about the prophetic books as resources, particularly about the artistic and truly brilliant way in which the prophetic books through a whole variety of literary means form the identity of their ancient audiences and of every audience that hears or reads them now. Um, but I think that I will wait on that. If we have time for discussion, you might raise a verse or two from your favorite prophet. Um, what I'd like to do is think with you a little bit about two developments in method in biblical studies that I think might be useful for you in your own leadership and ministry, whether you read books or just sort of hear about the questions that these methods pose and find then your understanding of scripture and witness and leadership to be um, aided by that. Um, these developments, relatively long known in other fields but new to practitioners of biblical scholarship because we're so busy with our Hebrew and Greek, we don't get to stuff right away. So English departments know things for, I don't know, 20 years and then we learn about them. Um, these developments are uh, trauma studies and post-colonial criticism. Just a few brief words. I will try not to be uh, too technical about it, but I think there is a lot that these approaches in biblical studies can offer us as we think about the prophets and our own lives of ministry and leadership. Trauma studies is a field that utilizes a number of disciplines, including sociology and psychology, to understand the effects of trauma on individuals and communities. In biblical studies, scholars working in trauma theory seek to analyze the effects of trauma, including the creative displacement of woundedness and powerlessness within the literature and art produced by traumatized individuals and communities, thus within scripture, within the literature and artistry of scripture itself as ancient Judeans um, early and especially late after um, the exile in 586 um, sought to make sense of the disaster that they had experienced and the almost complete breaking down of the bases for cultural coherence that they had known. 
a book I commend to you for its deft engagement of trauma studies in analysis of ancient Israelite prophecy is Kathleen O'Connor's Jeremiah, Pain and Promise, which came out with Fortress Press in 2011. I will actually pass it around. It's good to get your hands on books. Um, it may even be in the bookstore, or, you know, um, Micah can order it, or even Amazon. I'm no. saying that into the webcam. No, Micah will order it from the bookstore. <laughs> you will not now use online vendors for that. It's an excellent book. I really commend it to you. Quite groundbreaking. Here, O'Connor is working with a text shaped in the crucible of the Babylonian military threat against Judah, the brutal invasion of Jerusalem, a deportation, multiple deportations of many Judeans, destruction of the Jerusalem temple, and the effective ending of the Judean monarchy, all of which happened over a period of time from 597 to 586, the threat even earlier than 597. Um, culture um, coming to understand that it was doomed, and then the actual fall of Jerusalem in 586. The repercussions of this unthinkable disaster for Judean culture and survival um, lasted very long indeed and have shaped much of the Hebrew Bible, at least in later uh, reflections that we see in that work. O'Connor's premise is that the book of Jeremiah Notwithstanding its disturbing imagery and its insistent language of blaming the victim, which is challenging, she talks about how challenging that language is for her students and for herself. Um, notwithstanding how hard it is to get through the book of Jeremiah, uh, she finds that Jeremiah functioned in ancient days and still can function today as an effective instrument of survival and healing. This is because Jeremiah gives voice to the suffering of the people naming the reality of their pain in a way that allows the community gathered around the book of Jeremiah to reclaim their agency, to release the obsessive memories of trauma, and to move out of muteness and paralysis toward resilience and healing. Consider the following quotations from O'Connor as you think about ministries of leadership within uh, your own community of faith or another community of conviction within ministry or your other work. At first, she writes this, the writing of history usually eliminates human suffering, the blood, the pain, and the horrors from its reports about the past. Too often it dehumanizes victims and overlooks the horrible consequences of events for real people. O'Connor here names the sanitizing of history as an act of violence. I think experts in pastoral care would agree about that. The prophetic Christian leader must refuse to participate in the violent erasure of history, the forgetting of the trauma, exploitation, and harm that have been perpetrated against the bodies, spirits, and cultural heritages of real people in communities. Refusing to participate in this will require constant vigilance in the church where we do sometimes want to be nice. We want to not raise difficult issues before coffee hour. Um, in education, again, we're all about the critical thinking, but sometimes we don't know how to work with the real feelings that might come up in our classrooms um, if we really get at I don't know, issues of racism, issues of sexual violence, issues of hierarchical violence against folks on the margins of centers of power. Um, so constant vigilance not to slide into a collusion with forgetting that can happen in history. Uh, don't permit the silencing and forgetting of the real pain of communities. You can also just see rolled eyes if you keep naming this stuff, right? People don't always want to hear any longer about the difficult things. I think it is essential to Christian leadership that we name and stay present to um, the violence that people have experienced. So trauma studies helps with that. O'Connor also says, uh, and this is the second quote on your handout, uh, Jeremiah's war poems struggle with pain and march into its center. Rather than stripping away disasters, horrors, they translate them into symbolic dramas. Paradoxically, these poetic worlds of war depict horror and mute it at the same time. 
By reconstructing memories of invasion in imaginative space, they invent other ways to speak of it. They revise a vocabulary of experience and build common language to name what has happened, to give it shape, and to revisit it emotionally and spiritually. I hear so much deep resonance here, again, with pastoral care. With clinical pastoral education, I'm looking at one of my supervisors uh, from my experience there and our supervised ministries director also in this room. So much deep resonance with um, really the only way forward through this pain and through this suffering. Name, reconstruct, hold the space available so that um, communities can find new words to understand what has happened to them. So too, the Christian leader can use creative strategies to honor the reality of suffering in the world, in a local community, in a parishioner's family system, while speaking it anew into a different and safer context. It takes great courage to face this task. It should also be said that it takes considerable skill to avoid the danger of re-traumatizing uh, people who have gone through um, woundedness. Jeremiah's approach, and I would name also Ezekiel here, mm, teaching Ezekiel this semester. Um, harsh language of sexual violation, for example, when speaking of um, faithless daughter Zion or enemies. A Jeremiah's approach is not one that should be imitated willy-nilly. I really do want to be clear about that. Um, <clears throat> and Ezekiel too. Uh, that's obvious. Nevertheless, we must learn to speak of the pain that we carry in our bodies in our spirits and in our communities if we are to loosen its grip on us. Christian leaders have a vitally important role to play in this part of the healing process. It does take courage. You have to be brave, and you know that. Another aspect of the prophetic corpus on which O'Connor reflects is the role of the body and lived experience of the prophet Jeremiah himself. In the book of Jeremiah, as you know, we have prose narratives about the conflicts experienced by Jeremiah. You know, he's thrown into a well. He's also carried off to Egypt by Judean rebels. At one point, he is smacked across the face by uh, the priest Pashkor. I don't know if you've had conflicts in your vestry or board of elders meetings. I hope not to that level. <laughs> Nevertheless, Jeremiah, conflict, they go together. We also have the poetic laments or confessions of Jeremiah. Hosea, um, Amos, Isaiah, and Ezekiel also present the lives of those prophets as significant as signs of the purposes of God in relationship with the covenant people. So O'Connor writes, and you have it on your handout, um, Jeremiah's biography portrays in his, and I'm gonna read the whole thing because some may not have the handout, so I know your eyes can go faster than I can talk, but um, Jeremiah's biography portrays in his body the pain and loss of the people. It identifies him with those who stay in the land and with those forced to leave against their will. It presents him as a man familiar with sorrow whose life embodies every major consequence of the Babylonian disaster deprivation, isolation, death, imprisonment, and so on. Perhaps these strange stories about a life steadied the book's readers in their immense sorrow, displacement, and frayed existence. They may have helped Judean survivors reimagine life as they blended Jeremiah's life with their own. O'Connor goes on then to talk about how Jeremiah is, of course, carried away to Egypt. We hear no more from him in the book of Jeremiah, although there are um, refractions of possible fates of Jeremiah in um, extra biblical materials. But he survives because he is not killed in his book. He continues on beyond the book, as it were, and this may help readers and hearers of the book of Jeremiah to continue on as well. So the Christian leader, too, may understand her or his living experience and even pain as a sign of solidarity and endurance on behalf of the community, accompanying the community. The leader may then be more credible when she or he interprets signs of hope from within the community, having lived through what they live through, knowing deeply what they know. Trauma studies work on Jeremiah can help us to understand prophetic leadership in a way that acknowledges vulnerability. It's one of the chief contributions of trauma studies is to understand the importance of acknowledging and understanding vulnerability. That's something that is not embraced by the world, um, but it's vital, I think, for those who follow a crucified 
Lord. My last point, quickly, because I do want to have conversation among us all, um, has to do with the second development in biblical interpretive methods that matters, I think, for Christian leadership, post-colonial criticism. Post-colonial critics interrogate the master narratives of cultures that have colonized or otherwise subjugated indigenous peoples. Master narratives, right? The stories that groups or systems in power tell about the naturalness of their rule, the need for their assistance on the part of the indigenous or primitive community and so forth. These master narratives that make it seem so clear and obvious and beneficial um, and indeed uh, the purpose of God for a powerful nation to control and subjugate another nation or group. Okay, um, so uh, post-colonial critics then inquire into the ways in which empire, actual empires and empire as a trope for power, ways in which empire and political power are constructed in biblical texts, um, within those texts and also then by readers throughout the history of interpretation, uh, by colonizers and colonized alike. Post-colonial critics do very many things that I think are of interest to the Christian project. I will highlight just a couple here. Um, they resist the exoticization of the other, refusing to keep the other here as strange and foreign, um, but in fact owning the nature of foreignness and otherness and speaking out of that experience, which I think has um, phenomenally important understandings for Christian community, for, under, for welcoming in all who seek God and God's purposes, for welcoming the marginalized. So resisting, um, exoticizing the other. Postcolonial critics also resist the various modes of domination that assert the superiority of any colonizing culture. I told myself I would not utter the phrase American exceptionalism in this room. Okay, I just uttered it. I'm now not going to say anything about the relationship of that kind of discourse to um, colonizing rhetoric. Okay, I won't say a thing about it. Okay, we're moving on. The responses of those then, subjugated peoples or groups within a culture, responses of those who are forced into political compliance or cultural dependence can be complex indeed. It's not a simple matter of yielding or fighting. It's very subtle and very complex how people respond to the pressures and the lure of opportunities involved with assimilation and so forth. Postcolonial theory has developed an important array of tools to think about those responses. A number of books have been published on postcolonial theory and biblical studies. Um, more in New Testament than in the Hebrew Scriptures side of things. Uh, one book that I would commend to you is The Postcolonial Biblical Reader, a collection of essays by some 20 contributors, um, published in 2006. I'm gonna send this one around to in case you have um, that interest as you think about your own ministry. Um, I have two quotations from that volume just to ha help us think together about ways in which our understanding of Christian leadership can be enriched through post-colonial um, inquiry, and then I will stop and invite your comments, questions, and conversation. So the first quotation on your handout is from an Asian New Testament scholar, the post-colonialist and feminist Kwok Puilan. She writes, post-colonial critics pose new questions about the historical and literary context of the Bible and thereby enlarge the moral imagination of the interpretive process. Postcolonial critics highlight the struggles and resistance in the different colonial contexts, lift up the voices of women and other subalterns, that is, folks who are oppressed or subjugated or silenced, lift up those voices, and are sensitive to postcolonial concerns such as hybridity, a blended identity, ways in which your identity takes part in multiple ways of articulation. Um, Deterritorialization, that's a long word. I, I think it just means getting tossed off your land. Uh, this, that's my guess. Um, and uh, it's a new enough discipline that they really do like the long words. Um, that, that will change as they become more seasoned. And then hyphenated or multiple identities again. What does it mean to be, for example, vested as a clergy person, but also um, 
racialized as a member of a minority community in a dominant white culture, for example. You have multiple things going on. Or a woman tenured you know, at a fancy university, um, but you know, also the first girl to be tenured in your discipline. Or what, you know, there's multiple ways in which you can understand who you are in ministry, who your people in, in the workplace or in the public square understand who they are with, um, with relation to negotiations of power in different systems. Post-colonial criticism helps us think about that, and particularly its sensitivity to the realia of life under structures of domination is essential, I think. This kind of sensitivity is essential for the leader who's working to bring the grace of the gospel into contexts in which imperial power is fetishized, whether military power, political, religious, perhaps in economic terms too. And I don't, of course, mean only those cultures that have an actual emperor, right? I'm using empire here as a metaphor as well. Um, so there's a second quotation about um, divine wisdom and owning the specificity of who we are so that we can't write these stories that commodify particularity. Um, I'm not going to go into that right now because what I really want to do, and um, I, I had thought we might end at 9.30, but I hear it's 9.20, so I want to make sure you have time to get to chapel. I want to stop here um, with simply the affirmation that post-colonial criticism is rich indeed um, with tools for you to think about power and leadership in your various ministries and communities. Um, I want to stop here so that we can discuss together the relevance of the biblical prophets for leadership, whether your own readings of the prophets have, have led you to an insight that you want to share, um, or whether you might want to talk about what the hallmarks are of prophetic leadership for you. Um, I've talked about prayerfulness and joy um, and acting in love. You may have other characteristics or touchstones that you want to lift up. So um, thank you, and I invite now your conversation. <laughs>